good morning. And for the benefit of those who are joining us uh, eventually by video, uh, my name's James Galbraith. This is a conference at the LBJ School of Public Affairs on New Deals in Europe and America, uh, whose uh, conceptual unity is given by the, uh, the historical reach between the New Deal in the United States and the challenges that we face uh, uh, primarily from the crime, climate crisis and the necessary associated energy transformation. This conference is approaching that question from a very broad perspective covering the social, the political, the labor, uh, the financial aspects that will have to be dealt with in order to bring about a coherent and effective response to that crisis. Uh, and to bring to uh, start the proceedings this morning, uh, I want to uh, introduce a very special guest who very much wanted to be here in person, uh, but the affairs of state, uh, uh, not unsurprisingly, uh, take precedence uh, over academic meetings far away. That is the Prime Minister of Iceland, Katrin Jakobsdottir, whom I had the pleasure and privilege of meeting at a conference in Reykjavik, organized by Valur Ingimundersen, uh, a f some, well, a year or so ago, roughly, uh, and uh, who is uh, one of the uh, really um, dynamic political figures on the, uh, on the scene, on the scene, I would say the European scene, but on the scene really uh, in a intermediate position between Europe and North America. Uh, and we're very, uh, we were unable to, she was unable to attend today. She did, however, uh, send us two things. Uh, one of them was a nice blast of Icelandic weather so that you could feel uh, that you were uh, very much in the presence of, uh, of, a, of a friendly uh, uh, interlocutor. And the other is a very distinguished special representative, Hala Gunnarsdottir, and I would like now to yield the stage to Hala. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you for making this possible. It's uh, an absolute delight to be here uh, and get to represent uh, Katrin Jakobsdottir, who is usually referred to on a first name basis, Icelandic style, uh, because her last name, the patronym, just tells us that she is the daughter of Jacob. So we usually don't refer to each other uh, only with our last names. Um, and I'm bringing you her warmest greetings. Uh, it's true what Jamie said, that she genuinely wanted to be here with us, uh, but the domestic politics didn't permit that this time around. And I thought instead of like a traditional bio-like introduction, I would share, uh, share a little bit more like a personal narrative uh, of this uh, political leader. Um, Katrin is one of those politicians who never intended to go into politics. Um, she aimed at academia, which is one of the reasons she wanted to be here today. She's always drawn to it. Uh, she was fascinated by culture and language, also grammar, which is a, an interesting uh, interest. And her literary studies uh, at the University of Iceland made her a leading expert in Icelandic crime fiction. And this is an interest I know she shares with uh, Jamie. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is an expert position she still holds. So she still attends uh, literature talks and, uh, and meetings about uh, crime fiction. But a person with this combination of talents and interests, I, she probably never stood the chance of getting through her 20s without getting involved in politics. Uh, and let me explain a little bit uh, uh, about those interests and talents. First, she has a knack for spotting innovative ideas. And she is the fastest reader I know. And it's quite irritating if you sit next to her on a plane and you may be reading the same report or something. And she's over and like, uh, done with it in like 10 minutes. And I, I, I have an hour to go. Um, and she's so fast that audiobooks don't make any sense to her as they proceed too slowly. She just gets irritated. Um, second, she loves democratic decision making. And whether it's on a national monetary policy uh, or just roof repairs in her apartment building, she's all in for the conversation and the conclusion and you know, understanding the opponent and, uh, 
and reaching up, you know, creating a plan and executing it. And third, she finds it very hard to abandon anything she's committed to, uh, even if the decision was made uh, on the spur of the moment or, or just by saying a yes to something at the meeting. And she, she jokes about this a lot, that people who've been in politics for a while, they refuse to go to meetings because meetings are always the beginning of something. You're asked to do something and then you say yes. And this is kind of uh, how her political career started. Uh, is that she showed up at her first political meeting and said, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And shortly after that, she became the leader of the Left Greens Youth Movement. Uh, then she became the deputy leader of the party. Uh, then it's minister for education and culture. Then it's leader. And now it's first ever prime minister. Now, having grown up under the nuclear threat, she's always been driven by pacifism and environmentalism. She's the first leftist to lead an Icelandic government. It was a bold but also controversial decision to form a three-party, left-to-right coalition, aiming at political stability after the collapse of two governments in 2016 and 17, and focusing on infrastructure investment, equality, and the environment, uh, kind of green, green deal, new green deal style. And I believe Catherine is putting her mark on history as an intelligent, uh, courageous, and honest political leader at political times that undervalue such qualities, but overvalue and reward ruthlessness and uh, dishonesty. And when I say honest, I mean to the extent that in 2009, in wake of the economic crisis, she made an election campaign uh, promise of raising taxes, quite unusual uh, as, a, as, a, as a promise. And it wasn't because it was likely to attract voters, but because it was true. It was the only way out of the crisis at the time. Uh, because the protection of the welfare state uh, was a better option uh, than a classical neoliberal austerity. Catherine is the mother of three boys, and she was the first cabinet minister in Iceland to take a full-time five months parental leave, a move many said would destroy her political career. Well, they were wrong, and here we are, and please welcome with help of modern technology, Prime Minister Katrin Jakobsdottir. Thank you. Dear guests, I am delighted to have the opportunity to address this important conference on new deals in America and Europe. The topic conveys a sense of urgency in view of the current climate crisis and highlights the need for transnational coalitions to address it. The Green New Deal has already had galvanizing political effects on both sides of the Atlantic, while also spawning predictable resistance from regressive forces. As was the case with Roosevelt's New Deal, we are currently confronted with a historic transition. Roosevelt's much quoted admonition that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself is as relevant today as it was in 1933. The transformative content of his program, which grew out of diverse anti-establishment rebellions, did not reflect fear, but social courage and defiance. With the climate strikers, we are already witnessing such political boldness. It has served as a long overdue wake-up call about the need to make fundamental changes. Climate change cannot be divorced from social justice. Wealthy countries have contributed most to climate change, but tend to be most immune to the effects. The poor are more likely to be displaced and to be hit harder with contradictory environmental policies. Action for climate protection cannot be guided solely by green remedies. It has to take into account social considerations and class divisions. While solutions are currently available for 70% of emission sources, they are not being deployed at the scale or pace needed. The recent Climate Action Summit created new government commitments and a modest momentum, most notably on carbon neutrality and nature-based solutions. These steps evoke hope but they are still mostly symbolic. Even powerful supranational bodies such as the European Union cannot do much on its own. The EU's share of global CO2 emissions is now less than 10% down from 99% 200 years ago. Ideas on the left in Europe and the United States to develop a trans atlantic decarbonization plan are a positive sign, even if they still cannot be translated into reality in the current political climates for there is no alternative to transnational solidarity. I was starkly reminded of shared responsibility in tackling the global climate crisis this summer when I, 
together with a group of artists, scientists and climate activists, went on a trip to bid far farewell to the Icelandic glacier Ork. You may remember that another glacier, Eyjafjallajökull, gained worldwide recognition a decade ago when the volcano lurking under it erupted. Ork is a less known and less tongue-twisting glacier on a mountain top in western Iceland, except that Ork is no longer a glacier. The ice field that covered the mountain in 1900, close to six square miles, has now been replaced by a crater lake. It is certainly beautiful, surrounded by patchy snowfields and is now the highest lake in Iceland. But that beauty quickly fades in the eyes of anyone who knows what was there before and why it is no longer there. In the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow the same path. As the Prime Minister of Iceland, I am determined to make sure that my government plays its part in the fight against climate change. The government is implementing Iceland's first fully fund funded action plan, aiming at carbon neutrality by 2040 at the latest. The climate strategy consists of, num of a number of initiatives, ranging from a carbon tax to action against food waste, from recovering wetlands to setting up a fund to support climate-friendly technologies and innovation. Iceland has decarbonized energy production and is currently making the transition towards greener transport powered by renewables. Yet, as any Green New Deal initiative needs to be global in scope, our strategies also have to address the root causes of climate change. 50 years have elapsed since Robert Kennedy made the point that GDP measures everything except that, that, that which makes life worthwhile. And still we have many economic thinkers that are not taking social and environmental factors into account when talking about economics. My government has joined a group of countries within the Wellbeing Economy Governments project that seek to move away from such reductionist thinking. The project does not only focus on the flaws of the existing economic system, it also represents a commitment to build an, alter an alternative future focusing on well-being and sustainability within the context of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Iceland is doing well when judged by classical measurements for economic and social performance, having experienced high economic growth and low, low unemployment in the last few years. But while income inequality is lower in Iceland than in any other OECD country, poverty has not been eliminated. The 2008 banking collapse strained Iceland's welfare system and the rise in housing prices has come at a high cost for lower income groups. My government is investing significantly in social infrastructure, healthcare, welfare and education to make sure that the social system is prepared for future uncertainties. We are also implementing a more progressive income tax system and this is consistent with my firm political belief that the current climate crisis has to be addressed through egalitarian and redistributive means. Although we are witnessing far greater international awareness of climate change, we should not underestimate the political challenges and the power of vested interests and industries. Climate denialism as a political strategy has been taken up by some populist right-wing parties in Europe with considerable success. The Green New Deal has been met with ideological resistance, which has been directed against the left. The idea has been belittled and mocked and politically extreme, as politically extreme and unrealistic, too ambitious and costly, or even as a plot to curtail liberties and to create a centralized economy. This should not have come as a surprise. The New Deal was stigmatized in Roosevelt's time with right-wing personal attacks and criticisms echoing earlier campaigns against universal suffrage and the welfare states. The Green New Deal and other similar initiatives are seen as a political threat because of their transformative potential. Hence, they need to stay the course and redouble our efforts through transnational coalition building to fight for the cause. A makeover of the status quo is not an option. The only way to fight the climate crisis is to think big, to be defiant and to show courage in the face of political adversity. Thank you.